Section 13 of The Maker of Rainbows. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Maker of Rainbows by Richard Le Gallienne. Section 13. The King on His Way to be Crowned. In a green outlying corner of the Kingdom of Bohemia, one summer afternoon, the Grand Duke Stanislaus was busy in his garden, swarming a hive of bees. He was a tall, middle-aged man of a scholarly, almost priest-like type, a gentle-mannered recluse, living only in his books and his garden, and much loved by the country folk for the simple kindness of his heart. He had the most winning of smiles, and a playful wisdom radiated from his wise, rather weary eyes. No man had ever heard him utter a harsh word, and indeed life passed so tranquilly in that green corner of Bohemia that even less peaceful natures found it hard to be angry. There was so little to be angry about. Therefore, it was all the stranger to see the good duke suddenly lose his temper this summer afternoon. "'Preposterous!' he exclaimed. Was there ever anything quite so preposterous? To think of interrupting me at such a moment with such news. He spoke from inside a veil of gauze twisted about his head, after the manner of beekeepers, and was indeed, just at that moment, engaged in the delicate operation of transferring a new swarm to another hive. The necessity of keeping his mind on his task somewhat restored his calm. Give the messenger refreshment, he said, and send for Father Scholasticus. Father Scholasticus was the priest of the village and the Duke's very dear friend. The reason for this explosion was the news, brought by swiftest courier, that Duke Stanislaus's brother was dead, and that he himself was thus become King of Bohemia. By the time Father Scholasticus arrived, the bees were housed in their new home, and the Duke was seated in his library among the books that he loved no less than his bees, with various important-looking parchments spread out before him. Dispatches of state brought to him by the courier, which he had been scanning with great impatience. "'I warn you, my friend,' he said, looking up as the good father entered, "'that you will find me in a very bad temper. Ferdinand is dead. Can you imagine anything more unreasonable of him? He was always the most inconsiderate of mortals.' and now, without the least warning, he shuffles his responsibilities upon my shoulders. The priest knew his friend and the way of his thought, and he could not help smiling at his quaint petulance. "'Which means that you are King of Bohemia, sire,' said he, with a half-whimsical reverence. Where on earth, he was wondering, was there another man who would be so put out at being made a king? "'Exactly,' answered the duke. Do you wonder that I am out of temper? You must give me your advice. There must be some way out of it. What, what am I to do? I am afraid there is nothing for you to do but reign, your majesty, answered the priest. I agree with you that it is a great hardship. Do you really understand how great a hardship it is? retorted the king to his friend. Will you share it with me? Share it with you? asked the priest. Yes, as it appears that I must consent to be head of the world temporal, will you consent to be the head of the world spiritual? In short, will you consent to be Archbishop of Bohemia? Leave the little church that I love, and the kind, simple hearts in my care, given into my keeping by the goodness of God, asked the priest. To be the spiritual shepherd, asked the king, not without irony, of the sad flocks of souls that wander without pastor, the strange streets of lost cities. The king paused and added with his sad, understanding smile, and to sit on a gold throne in a great cathedral filled with incense and coloured windows. And the priest smiled back, for the king and the priest were old friends and understood and loved each other. At that moment there came a sound of trumpets through the quiet boughs, and the priest, rising and looking through the window, saw a procession of gilded carriages, from the first of which stepped out a dignified man with white hair and many years, and robed in purple and ermine. 
"'It's your prime minister and your court,' answered the priest, to the mute question of the king. And again they smiled together. But the smile on the face of the king was weary beyond all human words, because of all the perils that beset a man, the one peril he had feared was the peril of being made a king, of all the sorrows that sorrow, of all the foolishness that foolishness, for vanity had long since passed away from his heart, and the bees and the blossoms of his garden seemed just as worthy of his care as that swarming hive of ambitious man-wasps and earwigs over which he was thus summoned by sound of trumpet that happy summer afternoon to be king. Think of being the king of so foul a kingdom when one might be the king of a garden. But in spite of his reluctance, the good duke at length admitted the truth urged upon him by the good priest, that there are sacred duties inherited by those born in high places and to noble destinies from which there is no honourable escape, and, on the priest agreeing to be the Archbishop of Bohemia, he resigned himself to being its king. Thereupon he received all the various dignitaries and functionaries that could so little have understood his heart, having in the interval recovered his lost temper, with all the graciousness for which he was famous, and appointed a day as far off as possible, when he would set out with all his train for his coronation in the capital, a journey of many leagues. However, when the day came, and in fact at the very moment of the starting out of the long and glittering cortege, all the gilded carriages were suddenly brought to a halt by news coming to the Duke of the sickness and imminent death of a much-loved dependent of his, an old shepherd with whom, as a boy, he was wont to wander the hills, and listen eagerly to the law of times and seasons, of rising and setting stars, and of the ways of the winds, which are hidden in the hearts of tanned and withered old men, who have spent their lives out of doors under sun and rain. But to the great impatience of the court ladies, and the great bewigged and powdered gentlemen, the old shepherd lived on for several days, during which time the duke was constantly at his side. At last, however, the old shepherd went to his rest, and the procession which he, humble soul, would not have believed that he could have delayed, started on its magnificent way again, with flutter of pennant and feather, and song of trumpet and ladies' laughter. But it had travelled only a few leagues when it was again brought to a standstill by the duke, who was thus progressing to his coronation. Catching sight from his carriage window as it flitted past, of an extremely lovely and uncommon butterfly. The Duke had, all his days, been a passionate entomologist, and this particular butterfly was the one that so far he had been unable to add to his collection. Therefore he commanded the trumpets to call a halt, and had his butterfly net brought to him, and he and several of his gentlemen went in pursuit of the flitted painted thing, and not that day nor the next was it captured in the royal net, not in fact till a whole week had gone by and meanwhile the carriages stood idly in the stables, and the postilions kicked their heels, and the great ladies and gentlemen fumed at their enforced exile amid country ways and country freshness, pining to be back once more in that artificial world where alone they could breathe. To think of a man chasing a butterfly, with the king's crown awaiting him, and even perhaps a kingdom at stake, said many a tongue, for rumours came on the wind that a half-brother of the dead king was meditating usurpation of the throne, and was already gathering a large following about him. Urgent dispatches were said to have come from the imperial city, begging that his majesty, for the good of his loyal subjects, continue his journey with all possible expedition. His kingdom was at stake. The good duke smiled on the messenger and said, "'Yes, but look at my butterfly!' and no one but his friend the priest, of course, has understood. Murmurs began to arise, indeed, among the courtiers, and hints of plots even, as the duke pursued his leisurely journey, turning aside for each wayward fancy. One day it would be a turtle crossing the road, with her little ones, which would bring to a respectful halt all those beautiful gold coaches and caracoling horses. Tenderly would the good duke step from his carriage and watch her with his gentle smile, not, doubtless, without sly laughter in his heart and an understanding glance from the priest, 
that so humble and helpless a creature should for once have it in its power thus to delay so much worldly pomp and vanity on another occasion when they had journeyed for a whole day without such fanciful interruptions and the courtiers began to think that they would reach the imperial city at last the duke decided to turn aside several long leagues out of their course to visit the grave of a great poet whose songs were one of the chief glories of his land i may have no other opportunity to do him honour said the duke and when his advisers ventured to protest and even to murmur urging the increasing jeopardy of his crown he gently admonished them poets are greater than kings he said and what is my poor crown compared to that crown of laurel which he wears for ever among the immortals there was no one found to agree with this except the good priest and one other a poor poet who had somehow been included in the train but whom few regarded the priest kept his thoughts to himself but the poet created some amusement by openly agreeing with the duke but of course the royal will had to be accepted with such grace as the courtiers could find to hide their discontented and even in the case of some their disaffected hearts for some of them at this new whimsy of the duke's secretly sent messengers to the would-be usurper promising their allegiance and support so at length after a day's journey the peaceful valley was reached where the poet lay at rest among the simple peasants whom he had loved kindly folk who still carried his songs in their hearts and sang them at evening to their babies and sweethearts and each day brought flowers to his green bird-haunted grave when the duke came and bowed his head in that quiet place carrying in his hand a wreath of laurel his heart was much moved by their simple flowers lying there fresh and glittering as with new-shed tears and as he reverently knelt and placed the wreath upon the sleeping mound he said aloud in the humility of his great heart what is such an offering as mine compared with these and a picture came to him of the peaceful valley he had left behind and of the simple folk he loved who were his friends and more and more his heart missed them and less and less it rejoiced at the journey still before him and still more foolish seemed his crown so with a great sigh he rose from the poet's grave and gave word for the carriages once more to move along the leafy lanes and to the great satisfaction of the courtiers the duke delayed them no more for his heart grew heavier within him and he sat with his head on his breast speaking little even to his dear friend the priest who rode with him and scarcely looking out of the windows of his carriage for any wonder of the way at length the broad walls and towers of the city came in sight a city set in a fair land of meadow and stream the morning sun shone bright over it and the priest looking up perceived how it glittered upon a great building of many white towers whose gilt pinnacles gleamed like so many crowns of gold look your majesty he said with a sad attempt at gaiety yonder is your palace and as the good priest looked his face was all sorrow and the tears overflowed his eyes as he thought of the simple souls once in his keeping in his parish far away but presently the king looking again toward the palace descried a flag floating from one of the towers covered with heraldic devices as he looked it seemed that ten years of weariness fell from his face and a great joy returned look he said almost in a whisper to the priest those are not my arms the priest looked and then looked again into the duke's eyes and ten years of weariness fell from his face also and a great joy returned thank god we are saved the duke and the priest exclaimed together and fell laughing upon each other's shoulders for the arms floating from the tower of the palace were the arms of the usurper and the king that cared not to be a king had lost his kingdom and while they were still rejoicing together there came the sound of many horsemen from the direction of the city a cavalcade of many glittering spears the duke halted his train to await their coming and when they had arrived where the duke was a herald in cloth of gold broke from their ranks and read aloud from a great parchment many sounding words the meaning of which was that the good duke stanislaus had been deposed from his kingdom and that the high and mighty prince the usurper reigned in his stead when the herald had concluded the duke's voice was heard in reply it is well it is very well he said gather yonder white flower and take it back to your master 
and say that it is the white flower of peace betwixt him and me. And astonishment fell on all, and no one, of course, except the priest, understood. All thought that the good duke had lost his wits, which, indeed, had been the growing belief of his courtiers for some time. But the herald gathered the white flower, and carried it back to the city, with sound of many trumpets. Need one say that the usurper least of all understood? With the herald went all the gilded coaches, and the fine ladies and gentlemen, complaining sadly that they had had such a long and tedious journey to no purpose, and hastening with all speed to take their allegiance to the new king. The duke's own people alone remained with him, and when all the rest had gone, the duke gave orders for the horses' heads to be turned homeward, to the green valley in which he alone cared to be a king. "'Back to the bees, and the books, and the kind country hearts,' cried the duke to his friend. "'Back to the little church among the quiet trees,' added the priest, who had cared as little for an archbishop's mitre as the duke for a kingly crown. Since then the duke has been left to hive his bees in peace, and it may be added that he has never been known to lose his temper again. End of section 13